And good morning, everyone, or good evening, or good afternoon, whatever the case may be. And welcome to another edition on this Sunday night, Saturday night. God, I always keep getting my time things skewed up. Saturday night, October, no, it's November, November 2nd. Oh, my God, this this year is racing away. We're literally two months until the beginning of 2020. Can you believe? Well, there's all kinds of crazy things going on that one can uh, maybe not believe in right away, but are certainly, shall we say, um, uh, getting our attention, shopping for our attention, uh, riveting attention of a lot of people. And that swirl, that uh, crazy stuff is going on around Washington, D.C. So tonight we're visiting Washington, D.C., our old friend Stephen Bassett. We're going to talk about the state of disclosure, as the town is, of course, totally focusing now on this word that uh, a lot of people up until, you know, even a few months ago had not never uttered, never uttered, never uttered. I'm in great shape tonight. The word impeachment is disclosure of extraterrestrial realities going to be the last um uh, shall we say, segment, the last act of this extraordinary drama being played out in the nation's capital. Well, tonight, we're going to find out with, uh, uh, as I said, Steve Bassett, who has been on this show many, many times talking about a wide variety of things. And tonight, we're going to we're going to talk about this almost mythologized word, disclosure. If you go to our website, the other side of midnight.com, and you click on the um, uh, banner for tonight's show for Saturday, <clears throat> the 2nd of November. Um, that will take you to the guest page and scroll down a little bit. Or you can click on uh, those uh, those hot link items under under the banner where it says fast links. Click on mine. That takes you down to radio with pictures, to my items. So let me jump uh, right to item number three. <clears throat> we'll get back to item number two when we were talking with Stephen. Item number three, as you may or may not know, TalkStream Live, uh, which is one of these internet uh, carrier services that carries internet radio from all over the planet, um, it ranks the member programs that it carries according to uh, popularity, According to accessibility, according to the number of people, well, your friendly local radio uh, neighborhood, the other side of midnight, is up there now tonight at number four. All the biggies, Clyde Lewis and George um, and uh, a couple of the folks are ahead of us because they have huge networks, particularly of terrestrial affiliates, you know, th- hundreds and hundreds of broadcast stations and Thousands upon thousands of, um, of uh, online listeners. Well, we're ranked up there as the number four program in all of TalkStream Live's uh, daily uh, um, lineup. Um, and, of course, typically on the weekends, we end up number three or number two because, again, we can't quite compete with all those terrestrial radio stations, but uh, we are definitely giving them a run for their money. So if you want to go to... Item number three, you can kind of look at the background, how they do the tabulations. And again, tell your friends, tell your relatives, tell relatives of those relatives to tune in Saturday and Sunday nights at this time to the other side of midnight. Now, the other thing you can do is to have them join Club 19.5 because that way you don't have to stay up to any ungodly hours if you're a daytime person. You can simply listen in the car, listen on your smartphone, listen when you're jogging, listen when you go to pick up the laundry. In other words, listen anytime. So uh, go to the main page, our homepage. Look over on the left there if you're on a computer, and it says uh, you can join Club 19.5. Well, you might consider seriously doing that. For the subject of the evening, my guest this morning, Stephen Bassett, is the executive director of something called the Paradigm Research Group, which he founded back in 1996 to end a government-imposed embargo on the truth behind extraterrestrial-related phenomena. Steve has spoken to audiences around the world about the implications of formal disclosure by 
world governments of an extraterrestrial presence that's been engaging the human race for some time. And Stephen has given something like a thousand plus radio and television interviews on this subject going back, well, for as long as I've known him. He's been definitely uh, on the um, cutting edge of trying to get the government, trying to get official, I think it would be called officially the deep state, to change a policy which has been in place for over 70 years. PRG's advocacy work has been extensively covered by both national and international media. In 2013, Steve produced a citizen hearing on disclosure at the National Press Club in Washington, and in November of 2014, they launched two political initiatives in D.C., one which sought the first hearings on Capitol Hill since 1968 regarding the extraterrestrial presence, the other seeking to force the E.T. issue into the 2016 presidential campaign, and of course, thereby hangs a very, very interesting tale. So without further ado, Stephen Bassett, head of the Paradigm Research Group, you're on the other side of midnight once again. Welcome. Richard, it's great to be with you. And uh, it's great having you back. I mean, there's so much going on. Before we get to any of that stuff, I want to extend an extraordinary congratulations. And you're probably going to wonder, what, 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 what are you doing now? Congratulations for being in the town which has hosted the baseball team for the first time in 95 years, which just won the World Series, the Washington Nationals. Take a bow. I have to admit, after years of not following baseball, just got completely out of it. Though I, when I was a kid, I followed it greatly. Uh, when I got back to Washington, uh, moved, relocated back September 13, and I quickly learned about the amazing Washington National story this year. This is not a typical story at all. They, they were uh, they started off terrible. They were at 19 and 31, and were pretty much written off. Ah, oh, And they came together. Uh, sort of chemistry developed between the entire team, and they just started having fun. Before you know it, the last 70-some games, they won as many games as the Dodgers. They went to the wild card game. That's how they barely made it, made it wild card game. And I actually got to see my first baseball game in, I don't know, 35, 40 years, because a friend of mine bought a ticket, and we went, sat uh, not, not far off the third base line. He actually caught a foul ball, first one in his whole in his life. <laughs> Came down two and a half feet in front of my nose, but since I hadn't been to a baseball game in 35 years, I never moved moved an inch. Uh, he, he reached over and grabbed it. And this is an amazing game, uh, and that got me. And so I watched all the playoffs, got totally into it. It's been a fortune at Buffalo Wild Wings, and mm. uh, really it, it was an amazing series. And I guess I'm a, a Washington Nationals fan now, and I'm happy to be a fan. Since they're win- yeah, I'm, I, I back winners. What can I say? I, I back winners. So it's been great. It's been, and it's been, this, is, this town needed this badly, Richard, really needed this. Yeah, in the third hour when we bring Georgia on, I want to talk a bit more about this because to me, remember I, I said to you last week they're going to win, right? And what did the imitable Mr. Cynic, Mr. Bassett say? Oh, come on. I'll better be, you know, 19 to, to, to 5, right? Yeah, yeah. Now, it was an inside joke. And uh, <laughs> I, I was concerned. I thought maybe the magic was gone. But uh, uh, they pulled it out. But it wasn't easy, let me tell you. Um, uh, Houston's a great team. This is an amazing series. They broke records. They tied the record for the most consecutive number of wins in um, a um, in playoffs, eight. And uh, they were the first time in the history of the World Series. I'm not sure about the uh, National League and American League Series. First time ever that the away team won every single game of a seven-game series. <laughs> what that means, I don't know. I just don't know. But uh, they had the parade today. It was a beautiful day. Huge number of people were down there uh, having a great time. And I'll tell you again, I can't repeat this often enough, Washington, D.C. needs that very badly. Well, if I'm going to argue with you and Georgia at the end of the show, um, I think there's something more – Intriguing here than just a baseball team winning. I mean, the the, the story of the national baseball team, a, a franchise based there in D.C., has been fraught going back decades with very, you know, bizarre and unusual 
and totally non-consistent performance. I mean, remember the Washington Senators, which was the sure. name of the original team? I think I saw one Senators game there in Washington at that uh, at, at, at the stadium. And this was back when I was in school and I was in a, a kind of a tryout position for the Boy Scouts. And instead of taking us to the woods and showing us how to make campfires and, you know, navigate by the stars, our scoutmaster was a Washington Senators fanatic. And all he did was take the uh, club to the uh, baseball stadium. And, you know, when you're a kid, nine or ten, that's not your idea of scouting. So I quit scouting. <laughs> <laughs> you would have – everybody, every other kid – in the whole in the whole uh, troop was the thrilled and ecstatic at this guy for taking him to the games, but you the yes, senators you. were not. I mean, come on, it was like watching the Keystone Cops. There's Space. there's a reason why Washington did not have a franchise. In fact, this team, now the Washington Nationals, actually made a circuitous route to Washington by way of Montreal, Canada. I so believe true. this team is the old-fashioned <clears throat> Montreal Expos, if I'm not mistaken, right? Well, it was the Montreal. It's totally not that anymore. Yeah, it's now no. totally its own team, and uh, it's now it's now the Nats. We call them the Nats, not with a G, but with an N, N A T S. Now the political class here, we call them the Nats too, but that's with a G, G N A T S. And that's because, like the Nats in Florida, they just buzz around, uh, <clears throat> accomplishing nothing and, and driving you crazy. Okay, so tonight, <clears throat> Mr. Bassett, this is the rest of your life. Um, yeah. Why don't we, for a lot of people who may have forgotten how Steve Bassett came to grace the airwaves on this remarkably unique singular subject of disclosure, and notwithstanding the fact that you're a new uh, baseball fan, and of course the Nats deserve every ounce of credit because, as I was saying to you last week on the phone, they're going to win because the 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 chemistry, the metaphysics of the bizarreness of where we are in time and space is so off kilter that they almost have to win to balance out this bizarre equation. And as I said, when Georgia joined us, we're going to have a little more fun talking about this. But let's go back for folks that may have forgotten your own history in terms of Washington, Capitol Hill, this phenomenon called disclosure. How did Stephen Bassett, become a congressional lobbyist on the nation's capital trying to get you know exposure and truth telling truth to power in this extraordinarily arcane field of uf investigations i should mention initially that i am i'm a political activist basically uh uh i'm an exopolitical activist a disclosure activist lobbying or being a lobbyist is just a part of that. That's not the sole part by any means. Um, trying to get the message into Congress is extremely difficult. Even if you have money, which I assure you I haven't had, uh, but where you can make inroads <clears throat> is in the political media. And there I have had some impact. Uh, the political process in America now is, is uh, very much an interaction between the political class and the political media. And as we've gotten cable and, of course, internet and so forth, it's only intensified. So if you want to influence the politicians, it's, prob it's a lot easier to go to the media and get them to do it than to try to get in their door. So I, I've been working on, on the media for a long time, and, and as a result, is, there's 500 articles and mainstream press have been written about PRG's work, and I've got them on my website, naturally, paradigmresearchgroup.org. Uh, uh, I was able to generate 400 articles about the E.T. Clinton connection during that campaign, uh, and uh, I've held multiple events in Washington, D.C. in order to let them know that we're here. So the register of the lobbying on the Hill thing is probably the least uh, of the time that I have spent. Now, that's going to change here pretty soon, but uh, the long, the, the, the short story is that I came to Washington to engage the, the politics of this in uh, July. July the 4th, actually, is the day I arrived of 1996. I had a pretty clear idea what I wanted to do. I was going to register as a lobbyist knowing that the that particular 
registration was going to get the attention of the Washington Post, which it did. I got a substantial front page article of the business section, which back then, even now, is almost as good as the front page. And that was uh, my bona fides that allowed me to now start moving forward. And one of the key things that happened <clears throat> not too long after that was I was able to get on Art Bell, Coast to Coast, who was willing, thankfully, to uh, allow the politics of UFOs, what we called it then, uh, on his show, even though he hated politics. He'd gotten out of political talk to get into the paranormal because he wanted to leave it behind. But he saw the wisdom of, of, this, of this subject being on the show, and of course I've ended up doing – Many shows, 50 or more, I don't know how many, and others had come on. And for the first time in the history of the phenomena, uh, the political aspect of the ET reality had a core audience of size. Whatever it was back then in 96, 97, 3, 4, 5 million, whatever, uh, that was more than enough to see the issue into the comments. And and not and, and not simply because one show was done about it. That wouldn't have done it, but rather that audience was hearing the subject matter often. For years, uh, thus guaranteeing that it would become part of the public mindset. Once that was ha happened, I believe that that was one key uh, aspect of of the disclosure process succeeding and the inevitability of the end of the truth embargo. So Art Bell, of course, gets a huge credit for letting that happen, and of course all the hosts that followed him, and all the other hosts that have created shows, which are now ubiquitous, from live streaming to podcasting, you name it, yours is one. Uh, have been part of the education of the American people and substantial number of people outside of America to the fact that, yeah, ETs e e are here, uh, but you don't have the information because the government has decided you, you don't deserve to have it or don't have a right to have it. They've embargoed it, and then if you want it, you're going to have to service some political advocacy to change a government policy that has trumped the science. Um, and then that's been, uh, my, been my work ever since for the last 23 years. So do you really feel – I mean this is kind of like when we were kids. We used to drive you know, around on those two-lane highways, no interstates. And I remember one arduous trip we would make to Dover, New Jersey, where my grandmother on my father's side was living. And we would – you know, the inevitable four kids in a car on a two-lane highway – would be asking, you know, every 10 minutes, are we there yet? Are we there yet? <clears throat> are we at disclosure yet? Is it really just around the corner? <clears throat> I'm asked that question uh, every uh, 48 hours. Um, <laughs> we're, we're talking, keeping in mind that we're talking about the most profound event in human history, meaning a lot of people were wondering, I think, in the uh, <clears throat> early. 1900s, 1913, 12, whatever. Are, is there going to be a war? You think it's going to be a war? 1937, 36. It's going to, is there going to be a war in Europe? Mm. Uh, and a lot of people were able to figure out, yeah, there was going to be one. But war in Europe, the First World War, are trivial compared to the implications of disclosure. It is the most profound event in human history, and so the idea that it's going to be easy, it's just going to hatch, just real boom, and a chicken will pop out. No. Uh, this has been a 70-year birthing process. So in other words, the, the United States government, the human race by extension, have been in labor for 70 years without epidermals. And uh, it's painful and difficult and long and incredibly complicated. So what I can say about the last three years… Uh, is that things started happening at a pace, and I might even go back to five years, at the beginning of the campaign, the presidential campaign, when all the articles started coming out because of PRG's work in Washington that started connecting the leading candidate to the issue, generating 400 articles about in the middle of a major presidential campaign. But <clears throat> well, wait, 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 wait. When, when we talk about the major camp, we're, we're talking about the campaign of 2016, right? Yeah, it's going to 2016, yes. So we could go back five years, but let's go back three. Things are developing now so fast that trying to trying to follow it is like trying to count the boulders in an avalanche, and it's going to get worse. Uh, when an event of this magnitude involving as many aspects of government and governments around the world starts to uh, 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 arrive or get close to culmination, it's there are going to be a huge number of players. There's going to be a huge number of things happening. Uh, that keeping up will be uh, an arduous task. Uh, though there are some people stepping up to that task, 
thankfully, there'd be others. So just the sheer volume of developments, the sheer number of articles being uh, – and, and, the, and the, the type of developments that are happening, we are in a place we have never been. Uh, we're way ahead of where we were in 68 with that hearing. We're way ahead where we were in the 2001 period just before 911 when Steve Beer had his major conference at the press club. Uh, we have never been in this territory before involving people that have never been involved before in the public domain. So – are we close to disclosure? Closer, you bet. Could it happen at any time? Yes. What is the principal reason it's not happening tomorrow? Is because the timing happens to coincide, and this is the nature of history, with one of the most significant, complicated uh, political crises in American history. It's a big deal, and it's all-consuming. The entire Congress is being consumed by this. They, they're not, they don't want to deal with anything else but this. You're talking about the impending official formal process of the impeachment of Donald Trump in the House of Representatives. Oh, much more than that. I'm talking about everything that has happened since um, the election of 2016, everything that's happened. It's not just that. There's been plenty more, uh, and I'm, I'm going to turn this off, but we have multiple constitutional crises. We're going to have – there are plenty of investigations that are not directly involved with impeachment that are going to be – are happening right now in multiple venues. There's going to be criminal charges all over the place. It's just an absolute crisis, and it is affecting every aspect of American life. And so – So I, 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 I get the impression between the lines you're saying that it's not just going to be the potential impeachment through this formal process of the president – we're talking about a huge swath of the top tier of the Trump administration. Am I correct? Everybody uh, at the top tier of the current administration is affected, uh, and almost every aspect of society has been affected by this particular administration, going back and affected in a way that has generated heat, consternation, controversy. Mm. And, and sucked up media attention. So uh, this the ET disclosure process, the end of the truth embargo is 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 is, is, say, is up against this. Now this is this is not unprecedented. Uh, a classic example of this was the Indian independence movement, which, as the World War II approached, was making great progress. Gandhi was already leading it, and there there were many things happening, and they they were feeling pretty optimistic. And then suddenly war breaks out, and uh, uh, Britain declares war in Germany. The the leaders of the movement, though they weren't all in, in, it wasn't unanimous, but the leaders of the Indian independence movement decided they could not pursue that activism while Britain was at war, and so they had to sit back for four years, and it was just bad luck uh, for them, uh, bad luck for the world. We had the war, so this is not uncommon. It happens, and so right now we have. <clears throat> Uh, these two massively important stories happening in D.C. at the same time, one is pretty much in the background. We can talk about that, and the other is taking up the entire foreground, and that's the status that we're looking at, and, and that's what I have plunged into when I returned from California a couple months ago. Well, see, that's the advantage of having a long-form uh, radio show in the middle of the night. Although in some mm -hmm. places it's actually a little more uh, civilized. So when we come back, we are going to go into some real specifics. I want to I want to dissect this thing because um, when we come back, the first thing I want you to do is define the upside. Why have an awful lot of people, you and me included, been very you know tenacious, very dedicated, very uh, shall we say single-minded in trying to get this issue front and center? What is it about the idea that we are not alone, which is so cataleptic to the rest of, 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 of human civilization? Why, in other words, bottom line, why should anybody care? And I think if we answer that one, if we come back at the bottom of the hour, because we're going to take a break here momentarily, if we come back and we address that directly, I think that will be a very important uh, way to approach this because this is not something that's part of your everyday furniture. It's not part of suburbia. It's not part of you know normal discussion and disclosure. 
there is a reality out there which, even though it's not acknowledged in the mainstream press, except for occasionally, that reality is going to change things in a dramatic and irrevocable way. We're going to spend the rest of this morning, the next uh, three hours, talking, two and a half, I guess, as to exactly how that change is going to take place and what you can do to be a part of it. You're on the other side of midnight. My name is Richard C. Hoagland. We shall return. Club 19.5 to get access to exclusive member benefits. Listen to past episodes anytime on any device. Search the archives of over 180 episodes. Membership costs $9.95 a month, 33 cents a day. Support the broadcaster to provide you with the most interesting conversation available. Talk radio at the cutting edge of science and thought. The other side of midnight.com. And welcome back. I have a frog in my throat tonight. No, no, we can't have froggies in the desert. Welcome back to The Other Side of Midnight. My name is Richard Hoagland, and my guest this morning is Stephen Bassett, who I... Steve, you were the first officially accredited extraterrestrial lobbyist in downtown Washington. Am I not uh, correct? I was the first person to register as a lobbyist on that issue. Yes, that was the hook. That was that, how I attracted the media initially. It was 1996, so they thought that was a little unusual. Um, and it was mostly a marker. You, you, the reason you have to register as a lobbyist is primarily about money. If you're being paid to go and talk to people on the Hill by some corporation, government or something, they, they want to know about it, and they want to know the money that you're getting. And so if that's happening, you don't register as a lobbyist. You've broken the law. If you're not getting any money, it's a little less uh, of an issue. Uh, certainly, if you get deeply involved in some legislation, somebody might want to know, okay, look, have you registered as a lobbyist? Uh, but for me, it was more of a statement of gravitas. A normal, I call it normalization. Uh, there was all countless issues that had lobbyists uh, that are trying to uh, influence legislation, find influence the government. Some are some for very good purposes, some for not so good purposes, some with little money and others uh, working to deliver lots of money to the candidate through 501, C4s and what have you. Um, uh, so there's lots – but there was no lobbyist publicly connected to this issue, just like there's no political action committee, which is why I created uh, shortly thereafter the uh, exopolitics uh, – that's the political – that's the terrestrial phenomena, political action committee, XPAC, which is in suspension right now. It's really nothing to do with it at this point. It may come back to life. These were, these were just normalizations. These were raising the flag and saying, hey, we're, we're important too. And so for years, I was called the UFO lobbyist. I didn't like it. I didn't want to be called that because I, I don't like UFO. I, I would prefer to see that acronym buried somewhere and never, never seen again. But uh, eventually uh, it became – a, I'm a disclosure act, act, activist or truth activist or uh, an extraterrestrial phenomena researcher activist. So that's, that's how it happened, and um, that's been my path. Uh, I'm not a researcher. 
others do the research. I just draw upon that research in order to uh, get to the media with stories to uh, educate and what have you. Uh, so uh, they do the heavy lifting. Uh, but I've tried to keep the media deeply involved in this because <clears throat> as you as, – as we, I think we're starting to learn what you're talking media, meaning you're talking about major newspapers, you're talking about cable news, you're talking about social media. Uh, the media now elects presidents. It elects members of Congress. It changes government policy. It stops legislation. So it's, it's questionable to me what is more powerful, uh, one of the houses of Congress – or the media complex in the collective. Uh, it's not sure, I'm not sure which is more powerful. Uh, are they out of balance? Yeah. Is the, is the, is the Congress or the, or the, the political structure in, 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 in America out of balance? Yes. So everything's out of balance. And so consequently, we're getting a lot of, a lot of noise and a lot of flack and a lot of foo and upset. And hopefully this will settle down because we're not going anywhere as a country right now. Well, I think a number of the candidates, particularly on the Democratic side, uh, who are surprising <clears throat> in the depth and the breadth of their support, people like Andrew Yang. I mean, Yang is a technologist. He's an entrepreneur. He's a business guy. He obviously understands science and technology. And his sole campaign seems to be about this really stunning social, cultural, technological, political transition, mm -hmm. which is racing toward us at Warp 9 but that 99% of the mainstream is completely ignoring. I mean, I actually watched uh, Elizabeth Warren the other night trying to argue with Yang as to the fact that most of the jobs people are desperately concerned about now are going to be automated away by AI, artificial intelligence, robotics, in the next 10, 15 years. And there's no long-term plan in the political system to do anything about this except some – comments by certain candidates now that appear to be saying, hey, wait, maybe there's a real change coming. It's not going to go when Trump is defeated either through uh, you know, the, the impeachment process or through the actual next election. It's not going to disappear just because mm -hmm. Trump is no longer president. Yes, Yang. Um, he is a change agent, very sharp, and the only one that – that frankly had the capability of speaking to some very complex issues that I'm sure I assure you that every campaign advisor and media person is just sitting there beating their head with a brick, going, uh, "No, you, no, but they can't. Nobody can understand that. The public can understand that. You're losing votes," uh, which is true, and that's 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 not good. Our public in general is not getting smarter. However, I will say this: I think Yang is virtually guaranteed a a cabinet position. If there is a Democratic administration after uh, 2020, he'll be he'll be in cabinet, and his ideas will come into play, uh, uh, and hopefully have impact. So let's go back to this lobbyist idea. You've been in <clears throat> Washington since '96. You weren't formally a lobbyist in this area until maybe what 10 years ago, 15, something like that. No, 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 no. I was lobbying from day one. I mean, I, I was up on the hill. I was. Meet in the media? No, right away. But I mean, I mean, in terms of your being known for that, oh. it really didn't come into its own until you ran for Congress. You're not one of these, you know, uh, mm. those who teach but never do. You actually did it, and you had a remarkably intriguing campaign there in Maryland. You want to kind of talk for some people that might know about that background a bit? Briefly, uh, I, uh, I I got known for. To be frank, I got known for what I do primarily through the Art Bell Show. That that's how it happened, and that was absolutely critical. Which is why, of course, I owe him a tremendous debt. Uh, and I, I, but right in that period from ninety six, ninety seven, ninety eight, and even the early nineties, the, the the most prominent figure was Stephen Greer. He was engaging the politics of this in his own way in the late nineteen eighties, early nineteen nineties, and continued all right through that decade. And he was out in front of me. Uh, in many ways, uh, he had he had substantial funds. I, I, I had virtually nothing. Uh, so he's leading the pack. And, and in 2001, he made his what I would call first major play, and that was the the May 9th press conference, 2001, at the National Press Club in the ballroom, where I have held a couple of events myself. Uh, and so we... he brought he brought in he brought in uh, 18 witnesses 
he had a compilation tape of, I don't know, 75 witnesses where they condensed 100 plus hours of, of interviews. And these are all essentially witnesses. Everybody knows what witnesses are to this issue. Uh, most of them had government connections. This is a very powerful presentation. Uh, there was, it was the biggest press conference ever held at the National Press Club. And there was plenty of interest on the part of the media. Uh, and they were, there was going to be follow-up. I'm quite certain there was going to be follow-up. But before that could get underway, 911 happened, and that was the ball game. So uh, then after that, uh, he was pretty upset. I, I know he was upset and angry, and I was really upset. I developed some serious gastrointestinal problems that were putting me in the emergency room, and they couldn't find any cause. And uh, ultimately, it was just I watched those towers come down one, 100, two, three, 400 times too many. Mm. Uh, and plus the, the disclosure movement, or at least the disclosure prospects at that point were dead in the water, and I knew they were because uh, I knew it was coming. The moment those buildings hit the ground, I knew exactly what was going to happen next, and so – and it did. But uh, I, I, I went through a bad year, and then uh, – not bad. It wasn't a bad year. It was like bad four or five months, and then I decided I got to do something and uh, came up with the idea of running for Congress. What, what was going on then was that the, the congressional race of 2002 was uh, uh, going to be intense because there was a potential for a shift uh, of leadership in Congress, in the House. And the most interesting or the most followed race that year was going to be the one in my district, district the 8th District of Maryland, which sits right up against Washington, D.C. Therefore, it's obviously fully covered by the Washington Post, Washington Times, all the papers. So like it's almost the same as being Washington, D.C. And uh, there was a, a Kennedy Shriver in the Democratic primary. And the incumbent was a beloved and well-known uh, Connie Morella, eight terms. And so my thinking was if I actually got on a ballot, I could be talking about this issue in the middle of a very well-followed congressional campaign, straightforward. Mm -hmm. So – I got a team of volunteers around me. We went out, and uh, we gathered the necessary signatures. It was not easy. One of the hottest summers in Washington in many decades, that year, we were just suffering at the uh, grocery store, sitting behind tables, getting people to sign up. We got enough signatures. We submitted them, and I was on the ballot as, a, as, an, as an independent, which really means not affiliated. Why was that important? Because – I could – anybody can run in the primaries. I could have been in a, any one of the primaries trying to do the same thing, but you've got a bunch of people there, uh, and uh, you're not going to win the primary, and that's it. You're over. You get on the ballot, and you're on, you're on board all the way through the election. So ultimately, it was just the three of us, I believe, Connie Morella, the Democratic candidate uh, – uh, his name's Casey right now. I'll get it in a second – and myself, and so – Oh, Chris Van Hollen, who, by the way, is now a senator and a rising star and a potential presidential candidate. And, and uh, yes, I got in debates, and yes, I got into forums, and yes, I brought up the issue, and yes, it was treated properly and uh, uh, respectfully. I, I didn't get in all the forums, but I got in for most of them. I got into the major debate, and yes, it was covered. The campaign was covered, so I got a bit of attention for it. And it, it didn't cost a lot of money. Uh, I only got 1,700 votes, but I accomplished a goal. It didn't quite get the attention I was hoping because – and again, this, is, this, this gets back to the fact that political activism of any kind at any level doesn't operate in a vacuum. There's other things going on all the time that can throw a monkey wrench in your plans. So what happened in my case – Bill Burns still can't get over this. He wants me to write a book about it, but this is this is, <laughs> book. Is, it, is it about – I don't know, about two weeks roughly before the election – when the media is going to start seriously put attention to the candidates. And to tell the year again? Uh, this 2002. A man and a boy turned up in the 8th District of Maryland. Oh, my God. In a car. Right. Yes. And yes. start randomly shooting people. The snipers. From that car through a sniper hole. One, somebody got shot right at the, one of the grocery stores where we – right out in front of the grocery store where we had been collecting signatures. And this became the biggest news story in the history of Montgomery County. It was all-consuming, and as a result, the amount of coverage was far, far less. Uh, tragedy? Yeah, the tragedy was for the people that were shot, and there were quite a few. Uh, for me, it just reduced the potential impact of that particular maneuver, no problem. 
but uh, that got some attention. But mostly, uh, if anybody knows about me, it's because I, I was, unlike so many people before me, uh, was able to ride the internet wave. And by internet wave, I mean the internet broadcast wave. Um, and we, we, we now, every year, more and more broadcasting was done on the net, more radio shows on the net. Uh, eventually, of course, you get your streaming, you get your podcasting. And so I've done now probably well over 1,200 interviews, but the vast majority of them were uh, on internet media. And of course, the beauty of that, and it gets even better, is because that media – uh, you're, you're talking one-hour shows, two-hour shows. I once did a four-hour Art Bell, uh, and then it's archived and, and doesn't go away generally. This is a total paradigm shift from the old days when you, you might get a, a couple of minutes on a news program, maybe even an interview that lasted 10 minutes, and then it was stuck in the vault of that network not to be seen again. Uh, and so I was able to take advantage of that. And get and then ultimately I did get some mainstream news coverage. Haven't had it lately, but I'm optimistic that's about to change. So that's how I got known. I took advantage of the internet the best I could, and I and I I would do any show. I would do it on absolute short notice. I, I considered these shows and those microphones absolutely critical to to my work and to the to the disclosure process. And as a result, I think I developed a pretty good relationship with a very large number of uh, talk show hosts and so forth on the internet, and that remains the, the case to this day. Well, like all candidates, you went through the normal process of uh, town hall meetings, mm -hmm. campaign events, supermarket openings, the whole nine years. How does one run for Congress on an extraterrestrial platform? We don't call it an extraterrestrial platform. You, you make it clear that that issue is one of the key issues that you're, you're uh, dealing with. Now, there have been some people that have gotten into the political thing and, and try to sign up for campaigns. Uh, but they never get, they don't get on the ticket, and they they come they come across as basically a one trick pony. In other words, that's like I'm, I'm here to talk about that, and that's not unusual. There are candidates, single issue candidates, all the time. That's not gonna that doesn't work. You've got to be able to to talk about anything else. And I had enough exposure to politics in D.C. and so forth that I was able to address any issue, and that made it uh, stronger. So if they want to ask you about foreign affairs, they want to ask you about the transportation issues in Montgomery County, whatever, and you can talk uh, 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 you know, in a proper way about them, then you want to talk about the ET issue. Well, that's, that's the best, and I was able to do that. I, I, looking back now, if I knew uh, what I know now <laughs> 50 or 45 years ago, if I had the skills I have now, I'm pretty sure I could have run for Congress and won on a party ticket. Uh, but my life didn't take me that way, and that's fine. It's okay. Okay, so since we got about 15 minutes till the top of the hour, why is this a critical – you and I agree on some things. We disagree on other things, but we certainly agree on this issue, that if this issue is mainstreamed, if it's a properly addressed, it will transform the planet in a positive way. Why is that more than just an item, an article of faith? Uh, between you and me, why is that a reality that you can defend and did mm -hmm. defend in a mainstream congressional campaign? Well, let's be reductive about it. Uh, start at the top. Uh, ET, ETs are either benevolent or malevolent, so they could be a mix, a little of both. Uh, they could destroy us or not, and there's not a thing we can do about that, basically. So – Right then, uh, you have a simple choice. Uh, do you want to know about the truth of this or not, even though you may not know right away what the final outcome is going to be? And this is fundamental to, I think, being a citizen in a, in a country like the United States, democratic country. We're supposed to have a, a, a significant amount of transparency so that people know what they're facing, what they're up against. You don't declare war in some country and, and go to the people and say, well, we can't tell you what country, but we need your boys and girls to come, come fight for us, and we're not going to tell you where they're going. No. Um, transparency is even more important as you get into more important issues. 
this issue is the most important in the world. So the fact that it's not transparent is a serious problem. Now, is the consensus amongst the, the community of those that have paid attention to this that the ETs are benevolent or malevolent? The consensus definitely leans toward benevolent, but it is not uh, – uh, it's not uh, unanimous, but a consensus, consensus leads that way. Uh, so let's now refine that. ETs are here. The probability is a little bit greater that they are uh, uh, benevolent. Uh, another reason why we need to know about that. We need to know about them. We need to prepare. We need to engage. So is, the, the is, reason for disclosure intensifies. Steve, is this the latter assessment, which basically is kind of unvoiced? Is it primarily because ever since the big height of UFO disclosures in the beginning, back in at the end of World War II, 1947, we're still here. And if they weren't, if, if if they weren't benign, we would be a dust speck on the intergalactic highway. Well, it's more than that, because again, they could destroy us tomorrow. Uh, yeah, we're still here. That doesn't mean we're going to be here tomorrow, but there's much more than that. There's a lot of circumstantial evidence buried in the 70 years, uh, or rather uncovered in the 70 years, rather, that is promising. And, and no, no special order. Uh, yes, one. Uh, if there's been any destruction over the last 70 years, we, we did it to ourselves. We're very good at that. Mm -hmm. So we've blown up God knows how many buildings we've dropped no, how many bombs kill how many people but there's no indication that they've done that that's good uh there's the nuclear weapons tampering evidence which is extremely important and you're not hearing much talk about that because that one if it gets into play could be a game changer for sure and that is that they have tampered with our weapons repeatedly and in the soviet weapons as well and there's many witnesses to that now and there's going to be more coming forward and how did they tamper they turn them off they turn them off. They don't melt them down, which they could do, I imagine, but they just turn them off, and then we turn them back on. On a couple of occasions, they did something more radical, and that was they, – they, they, it's not that they turned them on. They put them in, in, in launch cycle, meaning the damn thing started to go into the cycle leading towards a launch, scaring the holy bejesus out of the people mm -hmm. on the site. And this happened here in, 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 in the Soviet Union, though I'm more sure about the Soviet Union than that it happened in the U.S. This, this is a much stronger statement, but but they never launched. That's that that process stopped. Uh, the, the the crews couldn't couldn't stop, and suddenly they stopped. So they turned they turned that off. That's interesting. Uh, the, the message. That well, the I was going to say, isn't that a kind of a message of warning? If you guys continue down this path, you're going to destroy yourselves. We don't need to do a damn thing. That, that's the way the witnesses – most of the witnesses that were there literally when it happened, that, that's the way they generally feel. Now, some hardliners would take a different approach. They would say, oh, this is just a, a, an indication of what we can do to you, and so you better get in line, start preparing for the takeover that's inevitable. Your weapons are useless against us. Uh, what was the phrase in the Borg? Uh, resistance is futile. Resistance that, that's the hardline approach. I don't see that. Other evidence. We, we, we know a great deal about contact. We've got thousands, hundreds of thousands of people have been submitting their accounts. Many hundreds, if not a thousand or more, have been interviewed and uh, published. We know a great deal about contact, not as much as we need to know. And we know that they, they take people, but they bring them back. That's notable. Um, they treat them sometimes when they are in their presence. Uh, humans are in their presence a little bit poorly. Uh, but on the, by the other hand, they also treat them well. And sometimes when things are not going well, they will take measures to make them go well. This is, this is common, common reports. Uh, the hybridization program is interesting. Is it destructive? No. We don't know exactly what the ultimate purpose is, but it's not immediately threatening. And then the crop circles. Look, you know, Doug and Dave didn't make all those crop circles. I'm so sorry <laughs> no. to inform the Pulitzer Prize winners out there. Uh, and that process, which is close – I mean it's really a dialogue that's been going on for decades now between ETs and humans where they have made progressively more complicated uh, crop circles, or, or uh, their proper name is agroglyphs. I was going to say for people who may have descended from Mars tonight and have no idea, 
what you're talking about. Describe that background. What what has been happening, and why is it still so ambiguous? They're able to put down. You know, you 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 uh, remember the ink printers, which are disappearing now because the damn things cost a fortune of ink, and it dries up, and I'm sick of them, and I, I've thrown them all away. Mm-hmm. Those those inkjet printers could print out a full four color, eight by eleven page, pretty good looking on good paper in what four seconds. That's pretty cool. Well, they can do it in wheat, so they can lay down in four seconds, five seconds, very quickly. As complicated a design as they wish in wheat, boom, or corn. And they started doing that, but they started off simple, and then they slowly got more complicated, which is clearly an indication of a progress towards something. All right, that's first and foremost. It's clearly something is moving forward. Right? But of course, humans couldn't, couldn't resist trying to see what they could do, and so they would go out and they would create some themselves. In time, we learned through research to identify which ones were human and which ones were not human. And so this dialogue is going on. Uh, the, the, the crops are generally not that damaged. All of, almost all of it is, is harvested. There's not much uh, other than the irritation to some of the farmers who eventually would collect some money. Maybe it wasn't so bad. Well, but, primarily uh, not because the crop was damaged, but because all these hordes of tourists suddenly trampled their fields. Yeah. Yeah, trampling yeah. the field, but that's not that's not they're they're getting that corn too, which is generally a pain. Some of them enjoyed it, some of them made some money, but mostly, but the damage is is minimal. Um, and, and and this began in the 1980s, this whole crop circle uh, aspect. When it started to become really an issue, and then the other thing is that they 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 do it in the same fields year after year after year. Occasionally, a circle of agroglyph will turn up somewhere around the world. Generally, um, immediately. Uh, not impressed. I, I just think the ones that are outside the UK are almost certainly not ET. And the reason for that is is that if you're off in some other country, you want to create a, a, some sort of an agroglyph. You got all the time in the world. Nobody's paying attention. And so people are doing that to have some fun. No problem. Uh, that doesn't mean ETs haven't done it. But what's most important is they keep going back to the UK to do it year after year. So they have the crop circle season. Now, every year, more and more people started going there for the crop circle scene. It was like a tourist thing, and they started showing up with ever sophisticated equipment, night vision binoculars, uh, special cameras, and then ultralight so they could fly around over the field. And they started to catch some of these things being made. Some of that footage may be faked, but we think they've caught some instances where they're seeing the things being made, Uh, but the most compelling evidence. Which is just simple. It's, it's simple. It's not even complicated. Is that someone would be in an ultralight and they'd fly over a field, be out there around noon, just cruising around, checking things out. They'd fly over a field at noon, and then they'd come back ten minutes later, and there'd be like a three, four acre crop circle, agroglyph. And I assure you, Doug and Dave couldn't have done that. A team <laughs> of students from MIT couldn't have done that. All right. And so that so they're doing this, and then these pictures are very artistic, beautiful. People are, are taking them, and they're, they're posting them. They're creating posters. They're putting them up on refrigerators all over the world. If that isn't a sense of benign indoctrination, I don't know what is. And so you, you add that to the, to the perspective, right? and overall oh, – oh, oh, by the way, uh, very common with the contact experience is messaging directly into the head. Uh, sometimes they would show that you'd, that you'd think you were seeing it on a screen, but really it's in your head. But whatever. And there was this common theme that kept turning up, and that was images of future environmental and destruction and warfare. Some of the contactees, I think, misunderstood that to be they're showing them the future, meaning they can they know the future. Mm-hmm. I don't believe that. Uh, I think they're showing them a possible future. They're showing them where we're generally going. Why would they do that? Right? Why would they do that unless they're, they're trying to deceive us with this understanding that, guys, you guys are on the wrong path. We're not going to come down and run you. My God, managing you would be the, the worst job in the galaxy. <laughs> but uh, we're, we're watching, and there's other possibilities here, but there, there's going to have to be some transitioning. Something's going to have to happen. Uh, again, the, if, you're, if you're evil, male, malevolent, <laughs> malevolent, you don't. You don't show people warnings about the things they're going to just, uh, do that are negative in the future. So I'm of a mind that the outcome is going to be relatively favorable. But let me be clear. Even if the outcome was absolutely existential, even if ultimately we are looking at total annihilation, the idea 
that a select few of people within a few select organizations would know that information and the other 7 billion would not is absolutely unacceptable. They may think they're special. May they think they're so super important. They may think they're the, the caretakers of us. But uh-uh, no. If we've got that future, then we'll face it together, all seven billion. We'll take whatever measures we need to take. We'll adapt as we need to adapt. But this elite information secret cabal crap is not mm. does not work for me. I'll tell you what, hold and it there. Got, and we got to leave it behind. We're at the top of the hour. We're going to come back to this when we come back after the top of this hour. You're on the other side of midnight. My guest this morning is Stephen Bassett, who heads the Paradigm Research Group. We're going to talk about why did he call it paradigm? Well, one obvious answer is because when this becomes generally known, when there is official government disclosure of the things he and I have been discussing over the last 20, 30 minutes, the paradigm will change. You're on the other side of midnight. My name is Richard C. Hoagland. We shall return. Thanks for listening to this exciting first hour. Now, the second and third hour of the show is available to Club 19.5 members only. Please support the show by subscribing to Club 19.5 and join our very interesting community. To do that, please visit the website, theothersideofmidnight.com, and click on the Join Club 19.5 link in the left-hand column. As a Club 19.5 member, you'll gain access to the rest of this show and all previous 350 plus shows that we have done. Now, recent Club 19.5 member archive recording have the commercials removed and the sound quality has been enhanced. You'll also receive a dedicated private podcast feed that contains these enhanced show recordings. And you'll be able to download the MP3 files directly from the archive if you prefer. As a Club 19.5 member, you'll also be the first to preview our new videos and reports. We'll be adding exclusive new features to Club 19.5 as we go forward. And boy, have we got some amazing things to tell you about in the coming weeks. So please support the show and don't miss all the exciting new things we have planned. I want to thank all our Club 19.5 members because without your guys' support, this show would not be on the air. Please help us continue growing the show by subscribing to Club 19.5 today. And when I say we really need you, we really need you. Over and out.